Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, for us, well, for the dads with us, happy Father's Day. Today we start a short five-week series that will take us through the beginning of the next school term. So end of this term, school holidays, and we'll start a new series at the beginning of next term. Today we're going to be reflecting on the importance of the Bible as God's revealed word to us. And then once we, you know, got a sense of why we should be listening to the Bible, we're going to start at the beginning. Um, the, the very beginning, the beginning of the Bible itself, which talks about the beginning of us. And, it, and when we do, it will take a look at what it reveals about our relationships with God, with each other, and with creation. Uh, today, the Bible inspired by God, that is, God breathed, the understanding we have as Christians that the Bible is the, oh, it's the final authority, the absolute standard. It's a thing by which we judge all else in matters of life and faith. Today, we're reminded that in the scriptures, in the Bible, we find wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Big call, isn't it? All right, so if you've joined us through Zoom or watching live on Facebook or seeing this later in a recording, welcome. For those who don't know, know me, my name is Samuel. It's great to have you join with us. We, like we often do, need to talk to God and ask for his help. So let's do that now. Let's pray. Our Lord God, you are true. Your word we can trust time and time again. What you say, you do. And when you speak, we hear what is real, what is good. Father, help us to listen to you. May your words to us in the Bible shape our thoughts, our priorities and our actions. Also, we thank you for fatherhood. We pray for dads today that they would understand the precious role they have in a child's life. We thank you for the love, the care, the discipline they provide. Help us to honour and give thanks for fathers. Lord, as Australia celebrates fatherhood, we, we know that for some, today is a reminder of grief. It's not an easy day at all. Grief, perhaps over a father lost, or of a dad who was unable or unwilling to be the father he was meant to be. Help those for whom Father's Day is a struggle. Please comfort them. Help us all to know that in you, we have a perfect Father. You show perfect care. You provide us with all we need to grow into the fullness of life you have chosen for us. God, our Father, you are true. And we pray these things, confident in the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now the reading. And we're reading from the second letter to Timothy, uh, the third chapter. So Paul writes, and uh, it's something that I feel we can uh, include to ourselves. But know this, hard times will come in the last days, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers, lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid these people, for among them are those who worm their way into households and deceive gullible women, overwhelmed by sins and led astray by a variety of passions, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Yanas and Yambras resisted Moses, so these also resist the truth. They are men who are corrupt in mind and worthless in regard to the faith, but they will not make further progress for their foolishness will be clear to all as was the foolishness of Yanas and Yambras. 
But you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured. And yet, the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Evil people and impostors will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is in prof profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Thank you, sir. All right, beautiful people. It's true, hard times come, don't they? They come in many guises, sickness, work, age, natural disasters like COVID. But there is another terrible cause of suffering, and it's, it's such a shame. And it particularly affects the church. It's a suffering that comes when people let go of the truth, when they, when they act against their conscience and in doing so harden their hearts against what is true and good until they end up approving what is corrupt. In our reading today, Paul is writing again to his dear friend and fellow gospel worker, Timothy. Now, Timothy, he was trained by Paul in the ministry and eventually put in charge of the church in Ephesus. But things, oh, man, they're tough. In this church, there are corrupt men turning people away from the truth of the gospel into a corrupt lifestyle. It's ruining them. <laughs> and in denying the truth, their lives, well, they become corrupt. And so Paul, he writes to Timothy in this letter to help him sort things out. It's a second letter that we have a copy of that Paul wrote to Timothy while he was serving uh, in the church of Ephesians. Well, he wants to get things sorted out because these corrupt men are making a mess. Look with me to verse 1. In these last days, the days between Jesus' resurrection and his return, in these last days, hard times are coming. They will come upon the church because of the moral decay that comes from resisting the gospel truth. Look at the list of vices that are racking the Ephesians church. The people are what? They're lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, Irreconcilable, they refuse to forgive each other. They're slanderers, they talk about each other behind their backs, they're, they're without self-control. They're brutal, without love for what is good. Traitors, reckless, conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. When our love for God is replaced for a love of ourselves, of our pleasure, then all the other vices flow freely. It's causing hardship and grief to this church. Hey, kids, I've got a picture for you to draw, first page. Uh, I'd like you to give your first page the title, Love God, Not Stuff. And then underneath, I want you to draw two pictures side by side. Um, do you ever see a, a little, really little kid at the shops and they're hugging and they're holding on to the leg of mum or dad, right? That's their safe place. <laughs> okay, so I'm, imagine God is the dad. But he's so big, you can only see his legs. And there you are holding on to one of his legs. You love God, so you're going to hold on to him. But on the other side, draw another person. And instead of loving God, they love stuff, pleasure, entertainment. That's what they live for. And so draw somebody trying to catch a whole bunch of stuff floating in the air like balloons. 
Uh, they're chasing floating money, floating ice cream, floating toys, tiny cars. Ah, oh, look, go for it. Draw a floating house. I don't know. But they're, they're chasing all these things floating in the wind. It's all this stuff. Imagine trying to catch all those. <laughs> the thing is, uh, we have a choice to make. And when we love stuff instead of God, the Bible tells us we'll end up doing the wrong thing to get it. All right? Let's hold on to God. Let's love him. Listen to the Bible and trust him, not chase after other things. Thanks, kids. When our love for God is replaced by love for ourselves, our pleasure, our stuff, then the other vices will naturally flow. I'm not saying that we'll be bad in all of them, but we're going to start ticking off that list. And being religious, going to church, you know, um, saying prayers and things like that, being religious is not a vaccine. Look at how Paul concludes his, this list of moral failures. Verse 5, these people who are corrupt, they're holding to the form of godliness, but denying its power. You see, there are men in the Ephesian church who are styling themselves teachers, guys who appear religious, but who themselves don't know the transforming power of genuine faith. They're dangerous because they look religious, but they're not generous with their money, humble, encouraging. They're not obedient to their parents. They're not grateful, holy or loving. They're not quick to forgive. They don't speak well of others. They're very good at highlighting other people's mistakes. They, they don't exercise self-control. They're, they're not gentle. They don't seek the good of others. They're not loyal. They're not, they're not delighted to seek the success of others or when others do succeed. They might, they might serve on a roster or even a committee at church they might even tithe. They might even lead a prayer group. They might look religious, but they don't know the power of faith. They are lovers of self, not lovers of God. So Paul warns Timothy. He warns us, avoid these people. If someone's claiming to be a religious leader, an influencer of our day, but they don't demonstrate the love of Christ, oh man, Avoid them at all costs because they, they can be really smooth talkers. And that's, that's what's happening in Ephesian, Ephesus. Sorry. Verse 6 onwards, there's a group of men who are targeting some women in the church who are vulnerable to the smooth, deceptive talk of these men. And why are they vulnerable? Because some of the women in the church are not grounded in gospel truth, in pursuing pleasure in sin, they're controlled by their desires, not by the truth of God's word. And so these corrupt, religious-looking men, but corrupt men, have wormed their way into these households. The corruption of these men and the vulnerability of these women, they've both arisen out of a failure to hold on to the truth or an outright resistance to the truth. Paul makes this clear in verse 8 with an obscure reference to Janez and Jambres. You know those two people? Uh, I, I didn't. <laughs> I, had to, I had to think about this for a bit and look it up. Um, Paul makes it this clear. Uh, just as Janez and Jambres resisted Moses, so these, that's the deceptive men, also resist the truth. They are men who are corrupt in mind and worthless in regard to the faith. That's what Paul wrote. You see, in Jewish and early Christian tradition, uh, these two names had become associated with the Egyptian magicians. Uh, remember how in the Exodus they initially imitated the, the miracles of Moses and Aaron? You know, they turned water into blood and they turned their sticks into snakes. It seemed that in the, in the face of all the evidence, their denial of God of the Hebrews was just ah, stubborn. <laughs> They didn't want to acknowledge the God of the Hebrews was really, truly God. And they tried to copy the miracles. But as God escalated these miracles, the magicians, well, uh, they were shown to be powerless in the end. They were not acknowledging the truth. Their foolishness was evident to everybody. 
But just as these corrupt religious men may make an initial headway into the lives of others, they're doomed to fail because they're resisting the truth. They're not living God's way, and God knows how things work best. Their foolishness will be evident to everyone. Verse 9. But they will not make further progress, for their foolishness will be clear to all, as was the foolishness of Janez and Jambres. Just as the Egyptian magicians failed publicly, so too will the disgrace of those who resist the truth. And uh, let's be honest, we've seen it before, haven't we? People who seek to justify their pursuit of their passions by twisting the biblical truth. Or in not knowing the truth, they fall prey to the moral standard of our world. We, we've heard of church leaders, members who've fallen into sexual sin, um, people in authority who've taken the money and run, or, or made themselves rich at the expense of others. Or think about churches who've lost God's vision for marriage and family. Or for Christians who, in their desire to win an argument, lose credibility by being hateful and mean-spirited in the way they debate an issue. Many Christians today don't know what it means to be a human in God's world, how God has shaped our relationships in his goodwill. It's actually one of the reasons we're going to look at Genesis in this series of talks. Genesis sets out the pattern of life and explains the core moral dilemma we face as humans. And unless Christians understand this, we're vulnerable to the shifting ideas, the shifting tides of moral subjectivity we find today. But for now, Paul warns Timothy. He warns us, lovers of self resist the truth and they can cause untold suffering in the church. If they claim to be religious but deny the gospel truth, avoid them like the plague, for their foolishness will soon be seen by all. But lovers of God, they hold on to the truth. After Paul warned Timothy about the disastrous effects of resisting the truth, and the effect it has on people, Paul gives Timothy two examples to encourage him never to let go of the truth. It's the, but you, he starts with verse 10 and verse 14. And notice how he twice says, but you, this is what I want you to do. Verse 10, this is what these guys are like, but you, you look to my example, what you've seen in my life, the genuineness of my message displayed in how I live. Even as the false religious men of Ephesus, they disqualify themselves by their immoral conduct and their rejection of the truth. Timothy, I want you to watch and follow me long enough. You've seen me. Paul's saying to Timothy, you've seen what I've done. You've witnessed my faithful teaching, my genuine conduct, the way he, the way he showed courage and trust and patience and love and endurance. Paul's saying to Timothy, look, you know it's true. You've seen it to be true. And Paul's commitment to the truth and his commitment to live the truth wasn't just in the easy times. They were, his commitment to the truth was tested when times were hard. You know, for the sake of the gospel truth, he suffered great persecution and oppression. The genuineness of his message was demonstrated by a God who rescued him from them all. That's pretty cool. Um, God saved Paul from suffering. Yeah, uh, no, actually. Um, how does this make sense? I mean, we think about Paul, right? The Paul whose ministry would seem like one continual beating and shipwreck from one city to the next. I mean, how does that reveal a Lord who rescues? Is it because he's still alive? Well, elsewhere we read that Paul's not at all convinced he's going to survive his current situation. He thinks his current predicament is it for him. It, it's not that God has kept Paul from hardship. It's that Paul is absolutely convinced that God is in control even in the face of persecution and hardship. That the salvation he receives is not one that is a salvation from suffering and hardship, but of something much greater. Hey kids, all right, next page for you. See how you go with this one. Now, this one, I want you to title it God's in control. 
And then underneath, I want you to draw a crazy zip line. You know those uh, flying foxes you grab onto or you strap in and they, you fly down the wire on camps and stuff like that or some of the parks nearby. But this one, this one is a crazy zip line. It's, it's not what you'd expect. You see, it goes from the top of a cross, the cross of Jesus, and instead of going down the hill, it goes uphill all the way up into heaven. It's pretty cool. And this zip line, the seat where you sit in, it's rocket powered, right? It's got boosters on it and rockets. So you might want to make yours propeller powered. I don't care what it doesn't matter. But the thing is, you're safely attached to the wire and you know you will make it to heaven. This thing's like fully souped up, this seat. It's got to get you there. But all around you are challenges. There's cliffs, there's rocks, there's thorn bushes, there's angry people shaking their fists at you, shouting mean things. But here's the thing. No matter how scary or how mean they are to you, you know that God is in control. He's going to make sure that you arrive at his throne room in heaven where you will be safe forever. It's why we don't give up on the truth of the Bible, which teaches us how to be saved and how to live for Jesus even when things get tough. Thanks, kids. Paul's life mission was to, de to declare the gospel of Christ Jesus to the world. And in all of his suffering, nothing held him back from his mission. In Philippians, in another letter, he boasts about how his imprisonment led to the guard and the household of Caesar himself hearing the gospel. I'm in prison! Bonza! It's working out really well! Well, why? Because the gospel has been promoted. He, his, his life purpose is being fulfilled. Nothing, nothing can take us away from God's love and his purpose for us in Christ. Paul's saying to Timothy, listen, my son, it'll be tough, but you've seen me, you know me, and you've seen how God's worked through me, even though it's been hard. Hang in there, buddy. Don't give up. Hold on to the truth. God will carry you through. Your ministry, your life will not be wasted. Church family, we've got to look to, to Paul's example. The authenticity of his message is backed up by the authenticity of a life lived for the gospel. And when you're suffering for the sake of the gospel truth, don't, don't give up. It, it's not because you're a failure. It, it's the world that says comfort equals success. Indeed, the word tells us suffering is a sign of a genuine desire to live a godly life in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 12. This is amazing. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's pretty direct, isn't it? Notice, wanting to be good won't necessarily lead to suffering. There's lots of people who enjoy a reputation for being good. Even wanting to be godly in and of itself isn't necessarily going to lead to suffering. Uh, to be godly is to live a life in order to please God. But again, lots of people seek to please the guy in the sky or follow other gods or being religious, or being a spiritual person isn't in mind here. No, Paul is quite precise. What guarantees persecution? What guarantees that we are partnering in the sufferings of Christ? Seeking to be a godly Christian. A life that seeks to honour God in Christ Jesus. You see, when our allegiance is to Christ, we will not be welcome in this world. The world's happy to welcome nice people, good people, friendly people, generous people, people who are very spiritual, people who have all sorts of faith ideas. But as soon as we hold on to Christ Jesus, we declare ourselves an alien in this world. The world will reject us. When our allegiance is to Christ, we are not welcome in this world. Persecution is a sign of a true faith. A life lived in order to honour the true God as citizens of Christ's kingdom. It's not a great sales pitch, is it? <laughs> it's kind of like, okay. But it's worth it. 
because any other life is a life lived in deception. And Paul doesn't want that for the church in Ephesus or in any church. Verse 13, evil people and imposters will become worse, deceiving and being deceived. When the church doesn't hold on to the truth, there'll be some who are very happy to take advantage of it. Paul here refers back to those false religious men who worm their way into the lives of the vulnerable. We don't want our minds to be corrupted. We don't want our faith to be made worthless. Better to be persecuted by the losing side than to join them. God is in control. Even in our persecutions, hold on to the truth. A truth Paul reminds Timothy that he's known not only from Paul, but from those who taught him since he was a child. Verse 14, Paul's saying to him, continue in what you know to be true. Don't let go. The Hebrew scriptures you were taught as a child, the gospel message that, that I've been encouraging you to proclaim and entrust to worthy teachers, don't let it go. Why? End of verse 15. Because the scriptures, the gospel message, are able to give us wisdom for salvation, a saved life, a redeemed life through faith in Christ Jesus. Our only enduring true hope is Jesus. In this life and the next, if we get sloppy with the truth, if we turn aside from the scriptures, from the gospel message, we lose the only sure foundation we have. Hey kids, got another one for you. All right, this one's titled God's Way. Now, this time, you're not on a zip line anymore, though that was pretty cool and fun, right? Although scary, because there was lots of challenging things around you. This time, you're walking on a road. It's a straight and narrow road, but it goes straight towards heaven. It's heading, boom, laser line, straight to heaven, yeah? And at the end of the road, draw some massive gates, but they're wide open. And there's a signpost over the gates saying, heaven. And behind the gates, there's fireworks, and there's music floating up in the air, because it's it's a wonderful party in heaven. That's the image we have of a big celebration, a big feast, music and joy and excitement. That's where you're headed in this narrow, straight road. But even as the road is narrow and straight, there's lots of side roads, turnoffs all over the place. And each of them has a sign on it saying, go this way, or this way's better, or more fun over here, or don't be a loser, go this way. <laughs> but you, you have an open Bible in your hands and you're walking down the straight, narrow road because you know that God's way is best. You're going to stick with what the Bible says because it shows us how to go straight and never get lost on our way to heaven. Thanks, kids. I want to see those, those side streets later on. Our only hope is in Jesus in this life and the next. If we get sloppy with the truth, if we turn aside from the scriptures, from the gospel message, we lose the only sure foundation we have. And just as we saw in verse 12, there's a key. Loyalty to Jesus. You see, knowing the scriptures is essential. It's absolutely essential. But it's not enough on its own. It's only when we study the scriptures through the lens of faith in Christ Jesus that the scriptures become our wisdom for salvation. And we've met them, haven't we? People who know the Bible, who can quote it easily, they've got a beautiful memory, they've, they've read it and they've memorized it and it's in their heads. They know the words of the, better, of the Bible better than we do. They know the words. They can say the phrases. In fact, they can use it often well. Hatefully, Boop to cut people down. It doesn't seem to change the anger that's constantly brewing in them that comes out, this the lack of willingness to forgive each other. It's like they, they, they've heard the words, it's in their head, but it hasn't travelled down into their heart. They haven't got a genuine, a growing faith. It's doing them no good, in fact, in knowing what's true and not acting according to the truth. They're even being hardened against it. They are lovers of self, of pleasure, not lovers of God. 
We cannot hope for the scriptures to be of any benefit to us without faith. However, once we've come to faith in Christ Jesus, once we've heard the simple gospel message, why would you leave this? Why would we leave this wisdom on a shelf? That's foolishness to be saved through the gospel truth and then turn aside from it. It's nuts. That's why Paul says in verse 14, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. Timothy is to continue in what he's learned, the teachings which are able to give ongoing wisdom for salvation. Who are we going to be? Paul is presenting a, a, no option. He's presenting one or the other. We are either deceiving or being deceived, or we are those who have wisdom unto salvation. Who are we going to be? Because there's a daily salvation which Paul describes in verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The scriptures are inspired by God. Literally, God breathed. And even though God used human authors with their own words and cultural context, ultimately the scriptures come from God. They carry the authority, the truth of God himself. And so Timothy, he he can have confidence in them to, to teach, reprove, correct, and train himself, but also to teach, reprove, correct, and train his church in righteousness. It's, it's why he needs to steep himself in Scripture, because they train him, the man of God, by implication, all Christians, that we might be complete, fully equipped, enabled to do every good work. We're to let the Scriptures shape our minds and our attitudes. We're to look to the Scriptures to critique our culture, to critique our personal assumptions and priorities. The scriptures define a greater authority even than the patterns of behavior we learn from our family, our communities, even our church traditions. Are we willing to be taught, rebuked, corrected, trained in righteousness? Are we willing to take hold of the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus? I hope so. It's why the scriptures form the center of our time as a gathered, a gathered people of God. Because if we're not holding on to the wisdom of God, we are being deceived. So make sure you're regularly reading God's word for yourself. Make sure you're, you're making the opportunity to read God's word with your family. Make sure you're taking time aside to meet with a godly mentor who, whom you give permission to challenge you with God's word, who will, will train you to read it well. Make sure you're an, act, you're an active partner in the communion of saints sitting under the authority of leaders raised up by God to teach you from God's word and keep you accountable to it. Commit yourself to regularly meeting with God's people each Sunday, just as the communion of saints have been doing since Jesus Christ ascended to heaven. Likewise, make it a priority to study God's word in each other's homes, physically or through virtual means as a COVID compromise. Why am I really pushing this? Why is Paul really pushing this? Because the gospel truth is our safety in the scriptures. In faith in Christ Jesus, we are secure in the truth and we are vulnerable when we think we can be strong without it. Lovers of self resist the truth. In rejecting it, they deceive and become deceived. They fall into sin. Lovers of God, they hold on to the truth. They continue in it. Those whose faith is in Christ Jesus steep themselves in the scriptures, for in them alone do we find the wisdom for salvation. It trains and equips us for every good work. Let's pray. God, I thank that you didn't just make us and set us off on our own and say, there you go, do the best you can, bye. No, you have been intimately involved in human history since the beginning. You've proven yourself time and time again. Every time you say you'll do something, you do it. Every time you say something will happen in the future, it happens. Lord, you are always utterly faithful to your word. What you say is reality itself. 
Lord God, help us to trust you. Help us to be so thankful that you've made for us a recording, a faithful recording of your dealings with his, us in history. That this is your word to us in the scriptures. That when our faith is in Christ Jesus, it is enabled, enables us to be wise unto salvation. That each day we can live a saved life, a redeemed life, a life worth living, a life headed to you, in you, under your care. That you would protect us from uh, the shifting sands of uh, emotional wisdom in this world that, that's just crazy and contradictory and different from one day to the next. You hold us to an enduring truth, one established in you. Because you are the one who endures. You are eternal. Lord, help us not to be lazy, discouraged, frustrated by the hard work it is to transform ourselves or allow ourselves to be transformed through your Holy Spirit by your word. Help us to allow other people to speak the gospel truth to us. Help us to be open to correction, rebuke, challenge, teaching when they are speaking gospel truth loving truth to us. Lord, help us to be disciplined in pursuing you in your word alone, in our families, in our church family. Help us to know it so well that our words and our thoughts are shaped by your word and thoughts. We want to honour you, Father. We don't want to see the vulnerable being abused and manipulated by people with smooth-sounding words, clever phrases, clever ideas, but in the end are a deception and deceive others. Lord, please protect our church from those who would lead us astray and help us to be bold and brave in speaking the gospel truth to our neighbours, our friends, our church family and to ourselves. Thank you, Father, that you have not left us alone. We have <laughs> ah, the good news of Jesus Christ. And we have a wonderful record of how you want us to live as we've watched you faithfully being true in the history of our world. Amen. If you're joining us on Facebook live stream or watching recording of this service, thanks so much for being with us. Um, my apologies about the crackling sound. I will keep working on that, see if we can improve that for next time. Please feel free to like or share this live stream with your friends. And you're very welcome to do that. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comment section and I will get back to you. I may not have the answers, but we certainly will have a conversation as we look at God's word. Next week, we will continue our series, The First Family, and we're going to explore the very beginning of the Bible, which describes God's creative work in creation. But more on that next week. Bye.